So here we are in part two of this video on the excretory system and homeostasis. So last time we looked at the kidneys and the role of the kidneys, how they function and the units of the kidney called nephrons and how each part of the nephron works in producing urine and getting rid of waste and waste in that form is urea and excess water and salts that are not needed by the body. So the excretory system really gets rid of metabolic waste, that's waste that is created when the body carries out reactions. And it must not be confused with ejection, which is just getting rid of undigested food. So the kidneys are not the only organs that help us to get rid of waste in our body. We also use other organs, believe it or not, that get rid of things that we do not need in the body or waste that is produced from reactions in the body. So you can think of other organs that would help us to get rid of waste. If you think of the waste, you'll be able to think of an organ that helps us to get rid of that waste. So pause this video for a minute and think of some of the other waste material that is produced in the body when there is a chemical reaction and then see if you can think of the organ that gets rid of that waste. Right, so you would have paused the video and now you are back to see if what you thought was correct or if we're going to cover that. So you will think of the fact that the body undergoes respiration and it produces carbon dioxide after taking in oxygen. So respiration releases carbon dioxide. That is a chemical reaction. And carbon dioxide must be getting rid of by getting it outside of the body. So an organ that would be involved in that process is definitely the lungs. So the lungs would get rid of carbon dioxide. There are also other chemical substances produced in the body that we release through sweat and sweat just like urine contains metabolic waste so urine is water plus metabolic waste sweat is also water plus metabolic waste although it is used to cool us down at times there is waste that is being excreted from the body so you might realize by accident, hopefully not intentionally, that sweat is sometimes salty. And the reason for that is because there are salts in our sweat, just like there are salts in urine. And no, you're not going to test that to find it out. Right. So, you are also going to think along the line that the skin is a part of the excretory system. It's an organ of the excretory system because it helps us to get rid of metabolic waste through sweat. Now, before we can totally understand, there are other examples which we'll look at later on, but they might not be so easy for you to think of at this moment. So we'll look at those later on, such as balancing the the glucose level of our body and other ways in which the body undergoes homeostasis or maintains homeostasis, which is a state of constant balance in the body. You, you often hear older persons say too much of one thing is good for nothing. And we also know that if we have too little of anything, it's also bad. So the body does not want too much of anything and it doesn't want too little of anything. So the body maintains everything at a balance and we call that balance homeostasis. So if you're too hot, your body tries to cool you down. You're too cold, your body tries to warm up. If you have too much water inside your body, through the process of the kidney, tries to get rid of some of the water. If you have too little, then your body will try to reduce the amount of water that it releases. If there is carbon dioxide, your body tries to get rid of it and take in oxygen and tries to keep that balance. If your glucose level is too high because of the sugar in your blood, your body will try to maintain that as well. So those are examples of homeostasis and how the body maintains the balance it needs. 
So when we talk about homeostasis, there is a feedback mechanism that we we use to understand how homeostasis works. So this diagram on screen is the principle of negative feedback, the negative feedback mechanism. There are normal levels which we try to maintain. So you see right here is normal level, normal level. If something rises and it's too high, the body is going to do something to try to get it back to the normal level. If it drops below the normal level, there is also something that the body is going to do to try to get it to the normal level. So the correction takes place by appropriate effectors and these are muscles or glands that carry out actions to drop the level to a normal again. It's at a normal and it is falling below normal. This results in a drop of the level and the body takes corrective action again by using the, the effectors, sometimes the same, sometimes not, to rise the level again back to normal. And that is how we keep balance. So that is referred to as the negative feedback mechanism. Now this is very general and I explain this now so that when we use the different negative feedback mechanisms in the body which are more detailed and specific, you'll be able to understand each one. So we looked at the kidneys in the first video, so think of the way in which now you think that the body would be using negative feedback to maintain the amount of water in our blood. And while you pause this video and think about that, we will be preparing to look at the negative feedback of the kidneys. Right, so there's a diagram that I'm going to pull up shortly and so as to not get you too confused, I'm going to explain what you're going to see or some key terms that you need to know before you can fully understand this, this diagram. So, you will notice that it involves the brain. We're talking about the negative feedback as it relates to the kidneys and the maintenance of regular blood concentration, the, the amount of water in the blood. So a part of the brain involved is the hypothalamus, which detects the concentration of the blood, how much water, the water level of the blood, compared to the other substances found in the blood. And the hypothalamus will, now s will send a message to the pituitary gland, which is the master gland, the gland that produces ADH, an hormone that, produce, that is responsible for the amount of water that is reabsorbed from the nephrons in the kidney. So we know that hormones are produced by glands and they are not used in the place that they are produced but they are sent to other parts of the body that need them to give instruction so that things can be carried out in the body. So these messengers will carry the message to another part of the body. So ADH which is antidiuretic hormone antidiuretic hormone is responsible for the permeability of the nephron. Now remember that the nephron is responsible for reabsorption of substances and permeability, you would have heard that word when we dealt with osmosis and movement of substances in and out of the cell. The more permeable it is, the more it allows substances to pass through. The less permeable, the less substances to pass through. And because this is a process of osmosis occurring in the nephron, we know that the permeability would refer to the amount of, that's right, the amount of water that is reabsorbed from the nephron back into the blood vessels. So ADH makes the nephron more permeable to water. So ADH makes the nephron more permeable to water, which means that when we re when the when the body releases ADH, the pituitary gland releases ADH, the nephrons will detect the, the hormone ADH and become more permeable and allow more water to enter back into the blood vessels. So on screen is a diagram of the negative feedback mechanism as it relates to the kidneys. So we have normal water content just like that first diagram that we saw. Normal is 
right here. So normal water content, normal water content. Now what would happen knowing all the the variables and knowing the key terms that we just outlined, the hypothalamus pituitary gland, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and the permeability of the kidneys. We can put it together now to see what would happen if there is too much water in the blood. You have just gulped down a, a few a liter or so of water and your body does not need that amount of water at the moment. What happens is that the hypothalamus, as we said, its role is to detect the concentration of blood, among other things, but in this video we're talking about the concentration of the blood. So it detects the concentration of the blood and it says, hold on, this blood is too dilute. Dilute means it, it has too much water. For example, you make some drinks, it's too sweet, you dilute it, means you add water to it. So the blood is too dilute, what would happen is that the, the hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary gland and the pituitary, pituitary gland responds by releasing antidiuretic hormone, which is shortened to, call, to be called ADH. ADH now is transferred in the bloodstream to the kidneys and it makes the tubules of the collecting duct, that's the final part of the kidneys, it makes it uh, impermeable to water. Right, so because water level is too high in the blood, the, concent the concentration is now low and the water level is too high, there's too much water in the blood, we, the pituitary gland would not release as much as much ADH as it usually does. So it cuts down on the amount of ADH. So it can be a little or no ADH being produced. Since there's no ADH being produced, there is nothing to make the collecting duct permeable. There's nothing to open it up so that it is uh, uh, releasing more water or allowing more water to be reabsorbed from the collecting duct. So less water is now being absorbed because the collecting duct is impermeable. The opposite of permeable, impermeable to water and very little water will pass from the collecting duct and into the to the blood vessels. So that is what would happen if there is too much water in the blood. The hypothalamus detects it, little ADH is released from the pituitary gland because there's too much water already and because of that the Collecting ducts are impermeable and they would not allow for the reabsorption of water into the blood vessels. But in a case where you might be very thirsty and you are almost parched and your body needs to, in that case, retain water and not lose the water, what would happen is that you don't want to pass the water out from the collecting duct into the ureter and down to the bladder. You want to keep it in the blood vessels. So what would happen is the opposite of this, of course. The hypothalamus detects that the blood is too concentrated, meaning that the, the ratio of salts is, to water is very high. So you want more water in the blood so what would happen is that it tells the, uh, the pituitary gland now to release more ADH and this is released in proportion to the amount of water that you need to maintain. It's not just a standard release but if there is a dire need the amount released will be large. If the need is not so great the amount released will not be so much. So pituitary gland releases ADH and ADH then is sent to the kidneys, sends a signal and tells the, the collecting duct, the, the walls of the collecting duct now to become more permeable. So they are now permeable, which of course means that they allow more substances to pass through. And in this case, again, the substance is water. This is a process of osmosis, so water is traveling and the permeability has increased, so more water can move from the collecting duct and into the blood vessels and so we have saved ourselves from drying out by allowing more water to move from the nephron the collecting duct of the nephron and into the the blood vessels and we would have saved ourselves and maintained the normal water content and we are back to normal
So this is how the body maintains itself using 